It won't happen. No. There's a good fish. That's a good fish. <laughs> Shamu! Cheers and good morning everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I uh, first wanted to say a big thank you to everyone who has supported us the last couple months on the apparel line, short bus diaries, and all the other projects that we've worked on. Um, it's really kind of helped make this whole dream of doing you know, YouTube and making these videos you know, more of a reality and more of a possibility. So we cannot thank you guys enough. And uh, if you haven't already, head over to wild-fly.com slash shop, pick up some stuff. We got mugs, we got hats, we got all sorts of things. So go check that out. Today we're gonna be doing a video with my friends over at Do South Outfitters. For those of you guys who don't know, Do South is a local shop here in Boone. And uh, my good buddy Max actually just took the business over. So he is now the new owner and head guide, which is super exciting. But today we're gonna be shooting a video on tailwater fishing, kind of what it is, how to fish it, and then highlight some guide tricks that these guys have. This is definitely a video that I wish I had when I was growing up and getting into fly fishing. Uh, tailwater fishing was always super intimidating and I didn't even really understand what it was. So uh, hopefully this can kind of simplify things and make it less intimidating. So hopefully you can take some away from this and apply it to not only your uh, tailwater game, but also just your overall fly fishing arsenal. So I gotta finish packing my bags, finish my coffee, and then uh, we're heading to Max's. Forgot the most important thing. I also didn't mention that Max has the coolest house. There are four guides that live here. It's called the Trout Palace. Oh, yo. Hey, oh, bro. Got me. All right, we got the boat here. We're getting the rods rigged up, about to roll. But first and foremost, Max, tell us what a tailwater is for those people who do not know. Okay, so a tailwater is typically a larger body of water below a lake. So what happens is there's a lake, a dam, a river beneath the dam. What this does is it provides a constant cold water influx into the river. This provides a healthy trout habitat year round. Um, it also provides a lot of bug life. And so what the tailwater does is it gives us an opportunity of somewhere to fish with cold water, even in the warmest of months. So today you'll see us wade fishing. We're gonna explain some wade fishing tips and then we're gonna go up and float high water in a drift boat and show you high water technique as well. So one of the things I wanna to talk to you guys about today is how do you set up an effective rig for tailwater fishing? Um, believe it or not, this is one of the most important aspects of it. Um, if you don't get your rigging right in the beginning, it can lead to a stressful day. Why am I not catching fish? This is one of the things I've been most excited to share with you guys. I think it's going to help a lot of you. This is something that can be carried over to really any stretch of river and help you be more effective while trout fishing. So with our rivers over here, typically the fishing is very technical. So how we do this, and this is effective for us here on the East Coast, it might be different for people out West, but what I typically like to do is I've got a relatively fresh leader here. I typically cut a little bit off of the leader to make it a little more manageable. So this is the end of my leader here, okay? I'm gonna take, we'll just do a few feet, tip it. Double surgeon's knot, connect this. Now, leader, tip it. So how much tip it you add to the bottom of your leader is gonna be dependent on how deep the water you're fishing is. So if you're fishing a really, really shallow, fast moving riffle, you know, try to figure out the depth you think it is. And what people normally say is you want to fish it the depth and a half. If it's a three foot deep riffle, you want to fish your tippet four and a half feet. So now what I do with this, cut your tag. Always use your teeth. <laughs> always, always use your teeth. The dentist does not like that. I put my bobber indicator above this knot here. So if I were to take a piece of wool, I like using wool on our tailwaters. They're easy to see and they float high. There's an in-depth video on our YouTube channel about how to do this. So if you guys want to learn how to do this, we'll link it below. You got your bobber here, your tippet. I like to tie my flies right off of this tippet here. Typically, if I'm fishing an indicator, I'm going to have a double nymph rig. 
So I'll have my heavier fly up top, drop down to something smaller, a midge, mayfly pattern, scud, something of that sort. But you might be thinking, why? what is the purpose of this? Why is this important? What makes this effective? The reason I do this is because if you think about how this is gonna sit in the water now, your bobber is gonna be here, your flies are gonna be here. What this is, is you have straight 6X or 5X in this case, running beneath your bobber. So what that does is A, it has a quicker sink rate. So your flies are gonna get to the bottom of the river quicker, but it also, you're not having this thick part of your leader trying to sink. And in our case with these technical, tricky tailwater fish, this is a game changer. This is gonna spook them. So all they're seeing is this 5X. This is gonna be floating on top. This is a common mistake I see with that people make when they first start trout fishing is they take their leader, you know, you got a brand new nine foot 5X leader. They tie their first fly right to the bottom of the leader and then they put their bobber way up here. Well, you gotta think now, you've got this bobber, you've got 10 pound monofilament tapering down to about five. Well, all this line in between that's thick is trying to sink. So you're gonna miss a lot of the fish you're going for because it's not sinking to them fast enough and they're gonna see that thick line. So this is very, very important. This is a guide trick that I use and it's helped me become more effective as a guide and catch more fish. We are en route to the South Holston River in Bristol, Tennessee. We are going to meet up with Drake Moore and Travis Neal, who work with us over at Due South Outfitters. Uh, gonna get into some wade fishing and then they're turning the dam on at four, so we'll give you a little bit of float fishing footage as well. My gink spilled in my cup holder. <laughs> These fish on the South Holston, especially this time of day, it's right around 1, 1.30, the sun's high, they're scared of everything in the sky. They've been running this 10 CFS flow pretty much every day for about the last month. So they're educated at this point. So nice long leader, make sure you're dropping it down to 6X. This rig we're fishing right now is quite a bit different than what it's gonna be when we float later. We'll have a little bit shorter of a leader, a little bit heavier line. We'll be fishing like a 2200 CFS, whereas this is 10. So we'll show you guys all that in a little bit. Rainbow. Nice. I was looking for a hole that had a little bit of depth, some moving water. We've got some foam out there. Those fish will stack up in the foam for a couple reasons. One, that's where a majority of the current in the river is coming. So that means there's going to be more bugs there. And another thing, you know, where the moving water is, is where there's going to be a little bit higher oxygen content. So, you know, we got some nice moving water through here. There's a constant supply of bugs coming into their face. When you're fishing just like really flat, flat slicks, it can be really challenging because those fish can see everything in there. So a little bit of moving water helps cover you up, help, helps you stay hidden a little bit more. Big one? That was that big one. That was an 18 inch fish that I just made. Story of my life. Nothing you could do. <laughs> Dude, that log right there screwed you. That was probably 22. Oh. Did you see him? I saw him. I saw him go right under that log right there. That's why it's 22 inches. How many times do you think that's happened to me when I've been with you? Every time. Yeah. Every single time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys, so we were fishing right there, a little bit slower, but now we're here. Um, this water's a lot quicker moving than it was up there. So initially the change I'm making is I'm gonna make it a little bit deeper and a little bit heavier. Why I'm making it heavier is because 
That water's fast. We need to get down to those fish as quickly as possible, but without being on the bottom the whole way through. So if you're not fishing fast enough in a hole like this, you gotta think all that time it's taking for those flies to sink is water you're missing. So if it's taking your flies 15 feet to sink to the bottom in the, you know, the strike zone, so to speak, where the fish are laying, you're looking at your flies hitting or being on the bottom here instead of there. So you, essentially you're missing all 15 feet of this bubble line that you could be fishing in. So when you come up to a new hole, think to yourself, okay, this is fast. Are my flies from the last hole gonna be heavy enough to get to the bottom in a timely manner to where you're not wasting half of this hole? So take your time, really dissect these holes as you go through it, and you're gonna have a more enjoyable day. You're gonna catch more fish by doing so. All right, Max, let's see it. Do the dirty. Look at that. First cast. Case in point, take your time. You know, it's not always gonna work like that. <laughs> Got lucky this time, but take your time to make sure that your flies are the right depth. Like if your flies weren't the right depth and weight there, you wouldn't have caught that fish. Broke him off. Didn't want him anyways. Kind of a general rule of thumb what you're looking for here i mean you look around where do you start so like right here you look we got a fast riffle i already fished that and then i moved over a little bit more and now i'm starting this cast right out in the middle of that rock where it drops off and gets deep right at the very top of it i'm trying to give my flies the most time possible to sink what i'm looking for a cast here good start it up let it run along that ledge out there just like that perfect no bite that time but start it up again hold hold your rod tip high high stick through all this stuff so what the high sticking does is it allows you to get that those flies in the perfect spot and keep them there especially something here where the hole that we're trying to hit is only you know maybe the size of a bathtub you know, there's no sense to cast it in and mend and mend and mend and mend and mend and mend because the only thing you're achieving is you're pulling your flies off the bottom, you know, however many times you mend. So get those flies in the hole, hold your rod tip up high just to where the bobber is not pulled out of the water and run them through just like that. All right guys, so we just met up with Drayton and Travis. I just started generating. Uh, so we went from weight fishing 10 CFS, now we're float fishing 2200. So what we wanna to talk to you about is how do you change now? What are the adjustments you make? The biggest difference between the low water, the high water, as you saw earlier when we were fishing the low water, you know, we were hitting pockets. We were looking for the deep runs in the river. Well, now everything's just about the same. So what we're gonna look for now are bubble lines, seams, places where those fish are gonna be able to stack up and just eat this whole time the water's on. So kind of what we're gonna do now is, got my leader, shortened it up a little bit, and I'm running 5X tippet off of my leader. Again, you know, I spoke earlier on adjusting the tippet depth to the water we're fishing. So now that this water is here, the water's a lot higher, I'd like to fish about a wingspan deep. Now, if you're not, as, I'm 6'3", so I got a huge wingspan. So 
you know, right around six feet is where I like to put my first fly. Um, and, you know, I talked about earlier, fishing a little bit heavier of a fly to act as your split shot and as something the trout can eat. And then we're gonna drop a midge off of that. But yeah, let's see what we can do with this high water. If you're ever floating up here, you'll see there's a lot of these foam lines developed beneath trees, around log jams, stuff like that. This is a great place for fish to hold. If you guys notice too, pretty much every time Drayton casts, he's making a cast up in front of us, kind of at like a 45 degree angle in front of us. That helps tremendously because as you mend, you know, your flies stay where you casted them. If you cast behind the boat, every time you mend, all you're gonna achieve is pulling those flies closer to you. There he is. So uh, we're, we're reeling up this nymph rig here because we're starting to see a few sulfurs coming off and some fish coming up and eating some sulfurs. So we're gonna get a dry fly rod in Drayton's, Drayton's hand here and see if we can get some of these fish to come up and sip some dries. On the water. Boy, that's a good drift. It's almost criminal. Got him! <laughs> Woohoo! Little guy, but he's cool. As the person rowing the boat, you play a very, very key role in your anglers catching fish because you're the one that's keeping them at the right speed. You're the one trying to keep them, you know, in that perfect spot. Since the water flows are pretty consistent through here, you know, there's not a ton of huge rapids. More so than anything, you're just trying to trying to keep the perfect speed of your boat with the water. So ideally, what happens is your guys cast in at that angle in front of you, like I talked about earlier. They give you one good mend and you keep the boat perfectly in line with their indicator. Less mending means the flies are moving less and you're spending more time fishing on the bottom. So try to keep your boat speed at the exact same speed as your indicators and try to keep the boat at a distance to where your anglers can make the cast to the hole, but not so close as to where you're going to spook them out of it. There he is. Toe to so. Toe to so. Brown, D-Rex. Right? There's a good fish. That's a good fish. <laughs> Shamu! That's, oh my god. Oh, here we go. Nice! Gee, that's a stud. Yeah. Look at that thing. <laughs> that right there was kind of a prime example. Like one of the questions we got asked was, what do you do for pressured fish? So one of our favorite things to do is get away from the mainstream of where every other boat goes. Go behind islands, you know, try to sneak into some other little spots. And that's, that was kind of key right there. You know, a lot of people will come down one side of the island and we went to the other there that fish was. So just try to be creative with where you go. Don't just take the same line every time you go down the river. I like it right here on the left to start. Kind of one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen guiding that a lot of people make from the beginning is, you know, you'll say, all right, get a big upstream mend, and what they'll want to do is just kind of jerk their rod down. You know, you're not really mending it. 
Here you're just kind of pulling those flies um, in a weird kind of unusual way and it kind of pulls those flies out of the strike zone. So by you know slightly high sticking that line you can use that rod tip to you know adjust that line without really having to move those flies a lot and it's all kind of a feel thing. After a while you know you'll kind of get the feel for how your rod works, how that line sits in the water and then you can kind of adjust it from there. Getting a little better at mending kind of allows you to hook up a little more consistently I think you know it keeps those flies in that strike zone a little bit longer you know it allows them to look a little more presentable for those fish. Just a slight little mend kind of adjust that line to where it's you know kind of even with that fly and then bam. Nice. That couldn't have been better timing. <laughs> All right, folks, that's going to do it for the video. Appreciate y'all spending some time checking out the video. A uh, big thank you to Max and the crew uh, for taking us out and sharing some of their knowledge. If any of you are in the southeast region or in North Carolina or anything like that and you are looking to come up and book a trip with these guys, I highly recommend it. I went on a guided trip when I was younger and it kind of laid the foundation for me of you know figuring out things about fly fishing that are very hard to learn on your own. So if you're in that position and you really want to kind of get a head start and really get on a good trajectory of learning and figuring out the right things to learn and how to do it the right way, um, I highly recommend getting a, getting a trip with these guys. So Max, if anyone wants to contact you, if they have any questions or if they want to book a trip or anything, how can they get in touch with you guys? There's a couple options. Give us a call at our fly shop. There's always going to be somebody there to answer your questions. Our phone number is 828-355-9109. You can reach out to us on Instagram, send us a message, or email us at contact at dosouthoutfitters.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we possibly can. There you go. Heard it from the man. And if you're in the Boone area, swing on by, pick up some flies. I hear there's uh, some, some wild fly swag in there as well at the shop. So stop in and uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. What's that? Set, Drayden, set! I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs>